This is your urgent call to action. We are all called to lead in a world in chaos, crisis, and turmoil. Join a pivotal global movement for change to transform the leadership crisis worldwide. Will you play it safe, or will you wake up, step up, and speak out? Like Nelson Mandela did for South Africa and the world, we need a radical new way to think, act, and lead, leading boldly into the future. Join host Ann Pratt, a Harvard Fellow and multi-awarded businesswoman, and unlock the best version of yourself to revolutionize leadership with what the world needs now. Greetings to all you future bold leaders. Thank you for joining us from around the world. My name is Ann Pratt, formerly from South Africa, and relocated abroad to attend a Harvard Leadership Fellowship in Boston, Massachusetts, in the United States of America. Our bold leader joins us today from the leafy northern suburbs of Bryanston in Johannesburg, South Africa. He is a results oriented a dynamic global corporate investment executive, and more recently, an entrepreneurial impact investor. A chartered accountant by training, he has led some of the largest investment companies in South Africa and Africa, with worldwide investments in India, Saudi Arabia, and around the African continent. He is Chief Executive Officer of Alt Capital Partners, an impact investor committed to the highest standards of excellence in ESG, environment, social, and governance standards. To date, he has delivered around 0.3 billion in US dollars investment pipeline, he is co-founding a transformational infrastructure fund and is focused on renewable energies and real estate. You definitely won't want to miss this as we explore and uncover how after multi-decades and multi-million investment successes, his big investment failure was his own. How his Mandela moment forever changed his relationship with money and investments. And why, in this world of money, power, and investments, future leaders will need to develop a good head and a good heart to achieve sustainable success. We warmly welcome the international traveler, investor, and change maker, Ben Kudasan, and welcome to Leading Boldly into the Future. Ben, thank you, my friend. It's always so wonderful to connect with you. Thank you for joining this international conversation. Thank you, Anne. Always a pleasure to see you and uh, looking forward to spending some time together. That's excellent. Ben, you know, you've had such a wonderful uh, career. Um, you've been in the world of, of money and, um, you know, making successful investments with a number of firsts. In your view of the world, and of course, the role of, of the, the corporate sector is so important in how we lead boldly and make these systemic changes we need in the world. What is your view around the role of money and the role of business in the world today? Oh, very good question. Um, I guess for me, it does start with money. Because money is an enabler, right? If you're starting a business, you need working capital, you need investment capital. So, yeah, I've made it my business to just understand uh, capital formation, savings and investments, and how that whole system works to catalyze economic growth and development, which comes in the capital that goes into the companies, and the companies clearly employ people and they create a value proposition and they employ people. And so the cycle goes round. So from investments to employment and then back to returns and it closes uh, the, capital, the capital loop. So I think business has got a very important role to play in terms of catalyzing economic growth and development. So it's quite an yes. important thing. So in terms of the role of business, you know, we've seen discussions about how the role of business has changed over time. And, uh, you know, it, tr traditionally, it's always been viewed as, you know, the purpose of business is to make a profit and, and create returns for shareholders. 
In your mind today, what is that role? Is it just about profit and shareholders or is it something more? And if so, what? Yeah, I think the current times are very interesting. Um, because I think 20 years ago when our population was, uh, I don't know, less than 2 billion, uh, it's clearly a very different role to today. And as an impact investor, I'm finding that capital allocators, if you don't talk impact, as in you don't talk ESG, environmental, social, and governance, yeah. you are effectively relegating yourself to not getting any capital allocation. And increasingly as well, I'm finding the investment community is now starting to play a far more proactive role with holding leadership to accounts to provide a balance between capital returns and uh, social returns. Because yeah. I believe that uh, they're not mutually exclusive actually. Uh, to make good money, you can do that while you do good by leaving the planet uh, in a better shape for our grandkids and making sure that, uh, I mean, you don't just look at shareholders, but you look at the communities that you are operating in, government, et cetera, in terms of just broader stakeholders uh, in terms of that equation. So, uh, so for me, I think it's a, it's a future. Yes. And those businesses that are still just only obsessed around one dimension called shareholder returns, uh, yeah, they're going to be left behind. I think. So that's a great pivot point, Ben. I mean, do you, in your world of impact investing, and, and if I hear you correctly, you're talking about this really being the future and, and the future of investments, but also the future of leadership. Do you have a practical example for us where either a company you went into or even from your, your own working life where there was a dark moment and uh, one had to really reassess one's values, the way one was approaching the investment either a company you were considering investing in or a company you were working in, can you take us back in time to a specific dark moment, a challenge, set the scene? How did you feel at the time? Uh, yeah, let me make it personal. So, so, you know, Warren Buffett says you must always invest in something that you know something about. Actually, not something, something that you know a lot about. So... As I was building my thesis around uh, impact investing and alternative assets, so prior to that, I had done a bit of work in terms of setting up uh, infrastructure funds that will address the energy crisis or the thermal coal crisis by doing more renewable energy, water, etc. So it was right about the same time I was thinking about uh, food security in the context of, I guess, Africa and the growth in population. So I decided to learn, and learning was putting my money where my mouth is. Yeah. So I bought two farms in uh, Wellington. This goes back now to 2017. So we farmed uh, guava, and I guess from 2017 until uh, we hit a crisis. Uh, I suppose the crisis really materialized for me in 2018. So the farms were greatly located. So there was no problem with the location of the farms. And sorry, uh, was that Wellington and the Western Cape? Which... Wellington and the Western Cape. Yeah, okay. Right and then uh, because I didn't know anything about farming, so I'm a farm manager who owned one of the farms. I was in partnership with uh, two uh, ladies, so I in 60% and they were 20% each. Yes. So I was able to bought at the height of uh, the guava cycle because from buying the cycle for guava just went south. So I needed to say operationally we took a bath, but then besides that, I had some moral issues with the farm manager in the sense that our fund manager started uh, stealing from us, but we couldn't prove it. Um, and then on top of that, I guess we 
ran out of working capital. So by last quarter of 2018, I could say I was in a dark place, right? As in we hadn't repaid uh, the bank, the repayments that we do. Operationally, we were making a loss. Uh, working capital ran out. And clearly you've got uh, families, right? In terms of farm workers that rely and make the, that's the whole livelihood is based on the operations. And I remember, I guess at that stage with our partners having to firstly make a call on the farm manager. And it was a cash 22 situation, mm -hmm. whether to beat him or not. So we, I suppose, issued him with, uh, I suppose it was a warning in uh, hindsight, but because we were in Johannesburg and the farms are in uh, the Western Cape, so there was also a distance as an, as an issue. Yes. And the whole thing and was just a nightmare. So it was one of those things where I guess I had to roll up my sleeves and uh, crash course myself into farming. So secure the offtake uh, arrangements, Operationally, I suppose, uh, work with the manager, even though trust was effectively broken. Mm -hmm. And having ready to invest some additional working capital into the business. And I learned a lot around stakeholder management because I needed to work very closely with the bank to prevent foreclosure, I think is what they call it in the US. So yeah. liquidation yeah. in South Africa. And the only thing I was concerned about is that all my income earning ability is the fact that I'm a chartered accountant. Yes. Uh, I'm a director of companies and yeah. I am a key man in relation to the financial sector conduct authority, which is a regulator for financial services in South Africa. And liquidation would have meant I lose my income earning ability because I can't be liquidated. Just in terms of the farms, if we go back there, how did you pivot out? What were the key steps? And, and you mentioned that eventually you sold, but how did you pivot out? And what was the final resolution in terms of turning around this really unfortunate, you know, bad investment, which was so contrary to your stellar investment career? So it was a series of uh, tough and courageous conversations. So one was with the bank. Yeah. I needed to get the bank to just understand that unfortunately, I mean, we had, besides the global cycle being what it was, we had also been two years of drought in the Western Cape, which clearly really impacted on yield. I had to enough, I guess, to a farm manager who was, uh, let me call it, lacking in terms of moral judgment. Yeah. So I, I just had to be honest and vulnerable with the bank and knowing yeah. clearly that the consequences could be left or right. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'll say uh, the process just helped me really fine tune my stakeholder management because, I mean, I had to clearly manage through my relationship manager I had to manage with the exco member. I had to manage with the chairman of the, the credit committee. So I, I really <laughs> went out to build relationships, uh, which meant that stakeholder got to be on site with me. So that was a first thing. And the second thing, I had to have a very, very tough conversation with the farm manager. So it was acknowledgement that trust and confidence is lost. Yeah, but that's what I've done. We are uh, because his family also left on the farm set. So okay. had I chosen to kick him out, then he would have been homeless. And at the same time, though, I needed to survive a season, and I needed him to still do his job because I was incompetent in terms of uh, farming, and all the relationship with the workers were with him as well. So we needed to then come up with a pack. So the pack was. We agreed to, I agreed to a profit share of some sort. So I'll forgo a certain percentage of the profits to him as an incentive in lieu of him effectively taking the majority of the working capital risk. Mm -hmm. um, and, and ourselves, I suppose, staying 
as Garen talked, is as I said, the one line of sight was that at all times the workers must be paid because a quick way to foreclosure or liquidation is not paying the workers and then going to the courts because that will trigger then an event which, as I said earlier, carry uh, catastrophic consequences on myself. So it was in oh. having uh, uh, that courageous conversation. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, then it was uh, it effectively being active. I needed to find an exit to the assets. Yeah. So I needed to invest time in the Wellington community and just the farming and business community of the Western Cape and try to find a buyer who was looking for uh, these type of farms, same size, or clearly had the capital and do the deal. And uh, then there was a poison pill. So I managed to sell the white farm uh, early on in 2019. Yeah. Then that farm had informal settlers in it. And the poison pill was that uh, uh, share sale agreement uh, put the responsibility on ourselves to sort out the informal settlers. Wow. I never realized how difficult it is in South Africa to get rid of informal settlers. I mean, I had to learn the law. <laughs> I had to make relationships with the municipality, find out programs that they had available to be able to execute. Long story short, I, we ended up having to build seven homes for seven families. Yeah. So the family did well because that was the only way of uh, meeting that condition. And uh, was, were those homes built on this farm or built on, on a different farm? On, a, on another piece of land. So on another I, I piece had to find another piece of land uh, where farm workers we could uh, build homes for and find a developer actually who was working on a scheme. So mm -hmm. yeah, it, it was a whole lot <laughs> of wow. innovation and it was very energy stepping at... Uh, yeah, it tested me at many, many different levels. Uh, but yeah, but very grateful to have been based out of it. And as I said, with many business lessons out of it. And um, yeah, and integrity, I guess, intact as well. So you exited the one farm. Did you finally exit the second farm? And if so, yes. Yeah, so the second that? farm, we managed to do. The second transaction with the same uh, buyer, but okay. right at the death. So last quarter of 2019, managed to convince him to buy the second farm as well. Uh, but Kenny, he saw me coming, so he got such a nice discount. <laughs> but uh, for me, it was also a very hard lesson to say, sometimes when your investment thesis does not work, pride should be put aside because loss is just an ego thing, I mean, because then you need to do a new investment case at that point and make a decision irrespective of how much money was thrown in to support the operations and how much you had acquired the asset for. Okay. But at the decision point, yeah, it was the best decision. So we needed to make it because, as I said, I was also buying my sanity because I lost a year of not doing what I was supposed to do in terms of building my business by putting out fires in these farming operations, which was not really a good investment of my time from an opportunity yeah. cost. Yeah, because of, of being distracted in terms of trying to resolve these, these big issues that had bigger consequences, actually. That, that's yeah. a powerful lesson. So where are you now? How do you feel now, Ben? <laughs> Yeah, I feel, I feel good, I feel good. Um, I suppose, you know, we, we talk about the J curve or we talk about, we only learn in uh, positions of discomfort. So we only become stronger by really overcoming uh, some personal adversity because that's when growth emerges. So I've learned a lot about people and in that process, I've learned and revisited a lot of what I learned at university, which then was academic and now needed to be put into practice. I learned that um, doing the right thing is something to be done now. It's not to be 
postponed because had I become fearful and delayed doing what I needed to do, it would have come at a huge uh, financial consequence. And just the value of courageous conversations. I mean, yes, yes. All very things powerful. need to be done. You know, it's very powerful, Ben. It brings brings me to another question. I mean, we, we know there have been a number of corporate failures in the world. Um, there are, there's a lot of research around the low trust of, of executive leadership and whether corporate leaders have that courage and that conviction to do the right thing for the right reason in the moment. And then, of course, the whole issue of accountability. So, you know, what happens to them when, when they make mistakes and err? So often we've seen, you know, not only, you know, we've seen in multiple countries around the world where there's the golden handshake. And so are these leaders really held to account? What, what are your thoughts around the issue of what accountability really is, how it is currently, is it, is it being enforced at all? And what do we need to do perhaps differently in the corporate boardrooms and corridors around the world? Well, that's such a good question. And, and I suppose as an investor, I blame the shareholders. Uh, I blame the investment uh, analysts uh, because I'll say what's creeped into the system over the last 10 years or so is this thing called short termism, right? Yeah. Is that uh, before CEOs were really judged, compensated, and rewarded based on the business plans, the vision, and uh, board approved strategies that they put in place, which was normally a five, six, seven year plan, yes. to all that being undone, to what are your numbers for the next quarter? And clearly the difference between uh, change of duration from quarter, quarterly results to, uh, I suppose, driving a long-term vision is now to survive in a based on quarterly results, it then forces you to make decisions that are most of the time to the detriment of the long-term sustainability of these companies, right? Because then um, you have to fire employees, okay? If yeah. uh, your cost line is under pressure. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, <clears throat> that is a one line, I guess that's easier to manage because it's far more harder to grow top line far easier to remove or reduce costs. Mm -hmm. And uh, and clearly in the process, so you lose your trust and confidence with your employees, because we always say business is about people. So a very important stakeholder is unsettled because they don't know whether they'll survive six months, 12 months, whatever the case might be, results in, let us say, a deteriorating uh, series of decisions that uh, are made by the execs, endorsed by the board, because boards, if I go there for a second, yeah, they, I think, also used to play a far more important role. But unfortunately, in this world of volatility or the, the type of world that we've been existing in, these big personalities in terms of CEO tend to carry far more to a far more influence over the board or the board's independence in some cases has been proven to be questionable by allowing the CEOs in my mind to get away with a lot. And because of this fear of uh, losing the superstars or, or how can I say the obsession with retention, a lot of money through stock options actually get thrown to what's his chief executives, as I said, and they're very much misaligned with achieving the long-term plan. And sorry, uh, Ben, just to pause for a moment, when you say this obsession with rotation, can you just explain? So are you saying boards um, have become more obsessed with not losing the chief executive, irrespective of the conduct of the chief executive and whether they're truly representing the values and the strategic goals and mission of, of the organization? Hmm. 
So I'm saying, yeah, because retention is a big factor in the board's uh, dialogue, right? Because yeah. I suppose uh, too much turnover at the CEO level is also negative for the share price, negative for the organization as well. So I'm saying, yeah, a lot of money does get thrown via stock options to keep the CEOs there. But I'm not necessarily saying that boards will necessarily condone bad behavior, mm -hmm. but boards will condone, um, how can I say, not achieving results if the CEO I mean, can uh, still provide a compelling case to say it's all part of the long-term plan. So yeah, so I'm finding a lot of inconsistencies in terms of how boards generally have been behaving by some of the CEOs of companies that have done some, I suppose, not so kosher things. What could the impact community be doing differently and what could and should boards be doing differently? Yeah, as I said, the, the good thing is I'm seeing, I suppose, uh, a bit of activism, which is actually coming from all spheres. So, so from the investors, I'm seeing definitely uh, a few, uh, strategic or policy decisions or choices that have been made. So, I mean, some of the asset managers have committed to uh, net zero by 2030 to, I suppose, force an outcome. I'm seeing the analysts also reviewing their stewardship pillar in how they analyze companies. So yeah. it's not just about balance sheet income statement and cash flow, it's also asking a whole lot of harder questions around, uh, say, governance, succession, uh, pay and remuneration. Uh, far more, I'm seeing shareholders actually declining a lot of the remuneration proposals that go to the annual ger general meetings. So I'm seeing the investor community being a little bit more proactive. And then also at the board level, so I mean, I said, on a board of the biggest uh, thermal uh, coal mine uh, in South Africa. And if I say that this last quarter, I mean, we spent so much time thinking about uh, the principles of responsible investing, looking at the, the, the just transition from thermal coal into renewable energy, looking yeah. at demand and supply, and, uh, and in my other boards as well, uh, I also sit on one, um, one of my boards as a bank where a lot of policy decisions have been taken, firstly in terms of how you fund uh, companies based on their ESG uh, score, yeah. and how you select and how basically we adjust the risk models to better fund, I mean, companies that are doing good either in terms of renewable energy or, or waste management or water uh, management practices. So I'll say that the boards is definitely happening and uh, the boards are, are playing a far more proactive role. So I'm seeing for the first time in a long time, the social and ethics committee. Yeah. Uh, because boards used to be mainly about the investment committee and the audit and risk committee. Yeah. But I'm seeing literally uh, the Dow uh, going up in terms of social sustainability and ethics committee. So That's it just shows that um, that balance, I guess, is, uh, is occupying a lot of the board agenda in terms of uh, yeah, how the board... But the profile of those committees, the people on them, their time spent on, on issues of social and ethics. So a reshifting and balance in terms of... Yeah. Focus, energy, yeah. resources, etc. Yeah, that's that's encouraging, Ben. I mean, as we know, this issue of accountability and moral courage, and of course, we know that it's not good for for stock prices and stuff if if there is a loss of a CEO and there's you know a lack of retention, etc. But but I guess the other question is when boards and companies do take firm action if there's been some question around um, a CEO's performance or executive management performance and do take bold action and are transparent with that. 
and then announced, you know, the appointment of a new chief executive who represents a different set of not only values, but behaviors. Surely there's a short term. I mean, what does that do from an investment point of view in terms of the short term pain versus the long term gain? You know, how is that perceived by the markets? Yeah, I suppose I'll maybe talk about uh, two big things that happened in South Africa without uh, naming the companies. So, so one was um, uh, a furniture company, a retailer, where the previous CEO, I suppose, in hindsight, defrauded the business, right? It um, yeah. blew up the share price, uh, declined a lot. Uh, lots of poor people lost a lot of their savings and investment uh, in that company. So there was clearly immediate change of the CEO because uh, I guess the news were, I mean, they blew up, right? It took a little bit of time for the board also then to take accountability for the actions, right? Because this fraud was a couple of years in the making and it kind of like put into question, what was the audit and risk committee actually reviewing, right? Sure. But Kelly, this was a very strong personality, a very smart man, who Kelly, the board, because he was so smart and such a charismatic fellow, believed him at the expense of doing their job. But anyway, so over time, there's been changes to that board. But then if I say there's been zero consequence, and I'm talking billions and billions of wow. rains that were lost from um, this company. So till today, uh, the CEO, there's no legal case or criminal case against him. I mean, he's still walking around free, except one jurisdiction is doing something about it though, eventually, and uh, this is probably five years down the line. Yeah. And, uh, and you know what I mean? It's now gone full, I guess, circle, and the changes, I suppose, are lending, and I'm seeing a little bit of confidence coming back into uh, that company, right? And another company where also quite a big conglomerate industrial in South Africa, where also the previous CEO was effectively creating fictitious profits to maximize, I guess, his own back pocket. Yeah. And when it blew, uh, that board was very decisive in terms of getting rid of him and getting a, a new CEO, and that new CEO, I'll say, I've been very, very impressed with the decisive actions to clean up. Yes. And as a consequence, uh, you know, I mean, the share price did dip on the news and has actually gone better from prior to the disaster hitting. So in your mind, Ben, I mean, you know, if we look at this kind of corporate behavior, is it sustainable? And if not, you know, are there perhaps three key thoughts you have around how corporates can just shift the culture that's currently operating? Is it sustainable around this condonation where, you know, people walk away without any real consequence? Is that sustainable? No, definitely not. No, no okay. definitely not. As I said, okay. The world has taken up. There's far more activism now from all spheres of society than there was previously. So I think a lot yeah. of people were passive, but activism, activism is very high now. So yes. that behavior won't be condoned, it will be addressed, and the perpetrators will be punished. It's just my view of it. Because all stakeholders, as I said, I'm seeing them effectively taking a far more proactive role, right? I'm curious to know, what are your three kind of key measurements of success with your project? Firstly, in terms of the return on the investment from, from an investment point of view. Secondly, in terms of uplifting the community. And thirdly, in terms of creating dignified home dwellings for, for, for more impoverished members of the Kailicha community. Uh, thank you, Anne. Um, I guess for us, it started uh, with the co-creation process. So it was important that the product 
uh, found resonance with their community of which it was intended to serve. So the aesthetics of the built environment itself was important. And then secondly, it was important though that the feasibilities made investment sense because uh, primary custodian, uh, the money is that we manage on behalf of others. So investment uh, return and parameters were quite important. And, and, and what did you, what, I mean, how well did you do? No, we did very well. Um, I mean, at the time we managed to get a design and a feasibility that was above the cost of capital. So investment returns were good. And then, but what really excited me though was uh, the impact that we had in the community of Kailicha, the jobs that we created, the dignity that we provided to people's uh, well-being, just seeing those smiles and when people have got pride in public space or in bricks and mortar is actually quite exciting because um, they bring a spirit to it and they bring a humanity to it. So uh, it was about the jobs that we created and just the general well-being of the community that uh, yeah, was immensely satisfying. And delivering good financial returns. Absolutely, that is without saying. Can you take us back to a Mandela moment, a specific moment? Where were you? What was the situation? How did you feel at the time? Yeah, I mean, where I got absolutely inspired. So I did this fellowship with uh, Duke University and the Gregory School of Business in uh, Cape Town. It was called the Emerging Leaders Program, but it was really about value-based uh, leadership. And ironically, part of the lessons were around civic leadership. So when the cohorts uh, from all over the world kind of like uh, uh, arrived in Cape Town, so one of the things that we did was to visit uh, Robben Island and we saw where Mandela spent uh, a lot of his time and, uh, and we came back into the classroom to reflect a lot of that. Uh, what was a dark moment or realization for me at the time then is that I had spent hours, okay, this, this was around about 2004, so I was about 30, 34 years old then. And by then, I guess I would say I had achieved most of what my parents expected me to achieve in life. Yeah. Uh, but what stood out was how empty I was. So I was one of two people from business in South Africa because I'm the cohort represented society at, uh, at large. And even though I would say I was a subject matter expert in terms of what I studied, I found that I was so, so disconnected to, to life. And mm -hmm. as people were contributing I felt I had no voice, I had nothing effectively uh, to, to give. And it was and all sorry, about ben, the, can I just clarify, when you say you felt you had no voice, why did you feel you had no voice or anything I, to give? At the time, I did not value what was inside or, uh. or on reflection. I had been living someone else's dreams and aspirations, and I did not know who I was and what my purpose in life was and what my individual dreams and aspirations were. So that event, I suppose, catalyzed what I would say was a journey of self-awareness that effectively started then and I've been going deeper and deeper and deeper into it. Yeah. And, uh, and along the journey, the, the two quotes that I suppose uh, resonated a lot from what uh, Mandela had uh, expressed in, in life. One is that our deepest fear is not, what, is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond major. Yes. And, uh, <clears throat> and those words resonated a lot 
as I was trying to make my way up the corporate uh, ladder. Yeah. And I was in conflict with, I guess, the, the leadership expectations vis-a-vis -vis my own uh, authenticity at the time. I was just in this uh, personal uh, conflict and discourse between them and the organizational ideals. And another statement that also uh, resonated a lot is that there is no uh, passion to be found playing small in a set in settling for a life less than the one you are capable of living. Yeah. And so those two statements were incredibly informative in providing clarity to my life purpose and my purpose in life or my mission statement and it is as clear as saying I co-create a world of joy and, and fulfillment, and I do that by caring. And the inverse is also true then that I contribute to the chaos in the world by uh, not being accountable and not caring, I guess. And, and I've seen how it's become true over time as my level of consciousness has actually improved. So, I say that is my Mandela moment that took me from darkness to self-awareness, self-appreciation, because I guess in leadership, uh, it starts with knowing that self, of because course. leadership is about bringing who you are to the party and not allowing yourself to be molded into other people's expectations of what is authentically you. Absolutely, Ben. That is, that is a wonderful story. I have to just ask, was it at various stages during your fellowship or was there a moment on Robben Island where Mandela was incarcerated for 18 years? Do you recall a specific moment that really yeah, stands it's, out? Yeah, it, it was a whole week's, um, I suppose, immersion um, because our whole week was about really reading a lot experiencing and leading from uh, Mandela's leadership from a seven perspective and a whole lot of dialogue in, um, in our group. So I guess that week was just the awakening for me and what then catalyzed the journey. And as I said, a lot of his uh, teachings and learnings and inspirational words came very handy as I embarked on my journey. That's that's wonderful. You know, Ben, you're you're in the tough technical world of finance. What do you think Mandela would say today to the investors in the world and, and the corporate um, boardrooms and directors? What do you think he would say to them today? Yeah, what I love, I guess, is evolve yourself so that you serve others as opposed to your own individual needs. Because mm -hmm. all of us utilize our God-given talents to serve and do better and problem solve the ills of the world will emerge uh, a better society uh, going forward and into the future. Mm -hmm. Be the light that is required. Be the light. Be the courage of speaking up for those without voices. Yeah. And you your position to do good. To do good in the world. Moving into a couple of fun fast facts. You know, you had a wonderful farm in the Western Cape, um, often the home of great wines in the world. Mm. You know, what is your favorite wine? Oh, my absolute favorite is the Torin Fusion Fire. Okay. And why that one? It's an amazing story. So if you appreciate wine, uh, wine um, in the older days, purity is what ruled. So either you had uh, Cabernet Sauvignon or a Chardonnay or a Shiraz or Pinotage or Melo, and then blends were the mistake, but blends were not really in. So fusion was a mistake. <laughs> because yeah. it's basically a blend that came out so well though, and uh, to the point that they actually engineered it into the beautiful uh, concoction of taste and texture and smell that defines uh, the fusion part. 
Oh, it's fusion wow. five because it's uh, five blends that make up the fusion. Okay. To... I look forward to trying that one day. Yeah. What, what, what was the key catalyst moment that led you into the world of finance and, and investments? Oh, such a good question. So as I was qualifying, I guess, to us being a chartered accountant and I was doing my articles, the only thing that emerged for me is that I didn't have the personality of an accountant or an auditor or a tax expert. So I did not spend a day longer in my accounting profession. And as I was grappling and thinking about what I wanted to do, I guess it was a process of elimination. I didn't want anything to do in mining because I thought it was depleting uh, Madaya's resources. I didn't really like industrial manufacturing and retail and the world of finance is what I appealed. So I then did further work to just find out about investment banking and asset management and asset management is really what appealed. And what appealed to it, I remember at the time, uh, there was a song by Whitney Houston, mm -hmm. uh, something about whatever they take away, they can't take away your dignity. That's right. So I was obsessed then. Greatest with, love uh, of all. It was called the greatest love of all. Greatest love of all, absolutely. Yeah. So I became obsessed then with uh, learning a skill that will be uniquely me, that I mean, I can leverage into whatever else I wanted to do in the future. Because I mean, truth is, I had, net, I had never invested a cent on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, but I was fascinated by the capital, the world of finance and money and how they can make companies and finance growth, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, yeah, so it was more the intrigue of it. And then we then found uh, fulfillment um, once I started uh, going down the rabbit hole in the world of finance. <laughs> and now I'm always cracking three decades into it. Wow. <laughs> So how would you define your relationship with money, Ben? Oh, another good question. Deepak Chopra's 21-day meditation course, and on day 12, there is, is dedicated to your relationship with money. Okay. And uh, so I guess my relationship with money today is informed by that. I believe money is good. It enables nourishment, it enables me to support uh, my family and my loved ones. It allows me to enjoy the pleasures of life. It allows me to give and help others less fortunate to, to me. So I embrace money. I believe in the abundance of money. While before then, I used to think it was a sin to have lots of money. It was something to be shameful about. Uh, but no more. Uh, money is my friend. It's, uh, it's like the oxygen that we breathe. <laughs> so I'll say I've got a very healthy relationship with money from that point of view. Great. And the other question I'm curious about, you went through this crucible moment in your relationship with money when you've had this amazing corporate career of having done multi, multi, multi-million deals um, you know, countless deals for large corporates and very successful deals. And then you had your own personal investment crucible around your farms in the Western Cape and having to extricate out of that in such a way that had very high risk for you because, as you said, you could have lost your own ability to make money, earn an income and pursue your career if you were placed into liquidations. My last kind of Fun fact question is, how did that experience change your approach to investments? Mm. <laughs> um, I'll go back to Warren Buffett to say, learn, 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 and don't invest in anything that uh, you do not know anything about, okay? Mm -hmm. So it starts, it starts there. And I'll say, uh, because I've been capital raising, and it is so hard to, to raise money, that when you're successful and you close out in terms of your fund or whatever you're raising money for, 
never forget how hard it was, which means that you apply so much rigor to how you invest it. Uh, because clearly there's, uh, yeah, th th there are many opportunities, but it's, yeah, you need to do the research, uh, go to level one, level two, level three, and be that certain that uh, your money is going to work and it's going to work uh, very well for you. And even though the experience also could have taught me a little bit of uh, cynicism about uh, people, it actually defined my uh, private equity investment philosophy. So my partners and I believe that, look, intellectual capital is now a commodity. There are a lot of clever people. Sure. But what we look out for are people with heart because we want people with good manners and good hearts. And the combination of heart and mind is what we believe differentiates us in terms of what we do. So it's another big lesson. So I look for hearts and, and I'm a collector of hearts. And uh, it's important to uh, invest in well-being and what we do. So. I do not deal with people that I suppose yeah, are trustworthy or they don't give me good energy <laughs> or I don't trust them. But, uh, but I invest some to just make sure that inherently people have got good hearts and then those are the people I want to do business with. That, that's remarkable. And just, you know, sort of final couple of questions. What do you think are the biggest challenges facing leaders going forward in the world today? Yeah, there is so much that's changing at the moment. And I mean, I am very disturbed, I suppose, by the greed uh, that I see, as in it seems to be about accumulating and accumulating and accumulating, as if there's a price when we die to say he or she with the biggest balance sheets, you know what I mean, <laughs> is a winner. Uh, but when I look at the levels of inequality in the world, uh, poverty that is still pretty much dire in most parts of the world. I mean, South Africa being a case in point where I'll say half of our population is still pretty much uh, in a state of uh, poverty, the rising unemployment. And so I'll say leaders who are not deliberate, purposeful and conscious towards addressing those environmental issues of, uh, I suppose, uh, energy, water, wastage, materials, yeah. and, uh, and addressing those social ills of poverty, inequality, gender discrimination, and, 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 will find themselves wanting. Um, so I just uh, hope and pray that as we engage in discourse, as we do more dialogues like we are having, <clears throat> that we catalyze and inspire people to think a little bit more beyond money or beyond capital returns and also factor the social returns into the equation to create a sense of harmony into the world. Well, Ben Kudasan, my friend, you are truly a man of head, a man of heart. And as Madiba said, a formidable combination. Thank you so much for sharing your insights, your vulnerability and your consciousness with the world. Really, thank you for this conversation. Thank you, Anne. It was a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you. My conversation with my good friend, Ben Kudasan, reveals and evokes a number of compelling insights, like the importance of money, the changing role of business, new metrics for business performance, and the rising tide of impact investing. But perhaps the most significant takeaway seldom discussed is what is your relationship with money in your professional and in your personal life? What does money mean to you? Is money simply a practical, tangible means of acquiring things, practical and beautiful things in this material world? Or is it that and an energy force, a force for good and enabler? John Kehoe once said, if you want to test a person's commitment, ask them to put a buck on the table. The corollary to that is, if you want to test the level of commitment, ask them to put more money on the table. 
And yes, commitment is important. But there is a deeper question. Do you manage your money? Or does money manage you? Is money your God that directs you and your behavior in your professional and your personal life in ways that you're not always proud of? Or is money an enabler, a force for good, a force for change? I leave you with the story. As a young child growing up in an apartheid era in South Africa, my late mother worked pro bono for a well-respected rural mission hospital in KwaZulu-Natal called Inutu. The hospital was run by two medical doctors, a British husband and wife team, the late doctors Anthony and Maggie Barker. It was a happy and a successful place, and it served the community well and was very well respected nationwide, perhaps the gold standard for rural mission hospitals in the country. I recall asking my late mother why Anthony and Maggie did not work in a city hospital or in a private practice where they could and would live like our wealthy medical doctor friends in the city. She paused and she said, you know, Anne, making money is good and making a lot of money can do a lot of good. Aspiring to acquire nice things and live a good lifestyle is commendable. But the amount of money you make is only one measurement of your success in life. She went on. She said, Anthony and Maggie love what they do. They serve their community with medical and social excellence. And remember, that the amount of money you make, and I have no doubt, she said, that you will do well, is not what you're going to be remembered for. When all is said and done, and you are dead and gone, people will not publish your bank balance or your balance sheet on your tombstone. Instead, it is the difference you've made and the lives that you have touched that will be celebrated. Two critical questions. What is your relationship with money and do you manage your money or does your money manage you? So until next time, remember that leading boldly is about making thoughtful, clear choices and bold leadership is about taking bold action, just one small step at a time. One step for you, but together, a giant step for humanity. So come back soon and join this global Mandela leadership movement for change. Because if not you, then who? And if not now, then when? Take care and take thoughtful, bold action. Thank you for listening to this episode of Leading Boldly into the Future. Please find links and connections mentioned in this show in our blog and never miss an episode by subscribing at ann-pratt.com. That's A-N-N-E-P-R-A-T-T.com. May these insights from inspiring industry leaders, remarkable disruptors, and courageous champions of change bring forth a brand new you, emboldened, empowered, and ready to inspire hope. Come back soon, share with your friends, Sign up on ann-pratt.com and join our movement for change. Why? Because the world needs you to lead boldly too.